In a new arms race for nuclear dominance, China is escalating its arsenal, and with Russia's help, it could soon surpass the United States. National security correspondent Caitlin Burke is following this story. She reports that defense experts are concerned that America could lose the nuclear edge. Newly unclassified information from the Pentagon makes clear that while China is quickly gaining, it has not yet surpassed U.S. nuclear capabilities. At the end of 2022, however, the communist power had amassed more intercontinental range missile launchers, or ICBMs. So that means kind of the, the holes uh, that they would be able to put uh, long-range missiles in uh, capable of, of striking the U.S. homeland. Uh, and so this is just the, the latest step in, in China's buildup. While many of China's ICBMs remain empty, their strategic partnership with Russia is a concern. Russia is providing fuel uh, for China's reactors that produce uh, nuclear material, these, these reactors that produce plutonium. Uh, and plutonium is uh, the important nuclear material material that China needs for its nuclear buildup. U.S. intelligence officials predict Beijing will soon be able to produce enough weapons-grade plutonium to increase its nuclear warhead stockpile as much as fourfold in the next 12 years. Those nuclear warheads would likely fill the now empty ICBMs. That kind of a buildup would also allow China to match the arsenals currently deployed by the U.S. and Russia. China is, is refusing to sit down and negotiate with us. Um, to me, that tells us that China is on an upwards trajectory and it has it has no interest in negotiating or uh, stalling it, its nuclear buildup. Shortly after the Chinese spy balloon dust-up, President Xi Jinping pressed military leaders for an even faster elevation of his armed forces. Meanwhile, Russia backed out of a nuclear arms control treaty with the U.S., leading experts to urge the Pentagon to develop a new strategy. We can't simply just try and try again for, for arms control if it's not working. We'll, we'll have to do everything we can to strengthen uh, our own nuclear deterrent and make sure we're building uh, the right capabilities that we need to uh, deter Russia and China and make sure that they can't ever think that, even as they, they build up their nuclear weapons, that they can get away with using them. The Heritage Foundation's Patty Jane Geller, a senior policy analyst for nuclear deterrence and missile defense, says U.S. capabilities have thus far stayed the same as Russia and China compete in an unofficial arms race to nuclear dominance. The problem is the leaders in the arms race are Russia and China. The United States has not quite entered it yet. Senior Pentagon officials say the U.S. is working to modernize all three legs of its land, sea and air-based arsenals. The question remains whether the pace will be quick enough to keep our adversaries at bay. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Well, here's the problem with nuclear weapons and the buildup of nuclear weapons. You're actually throwing away money, and, and then you're creating a stockpile that you have to maintain and you have to watch over, and you hope that you never use them. And who wants to live in a world where these nuclear arsenals are unleashed? That has been the whole mutual assured destu destruction doctrine, why other countries want to get involved and try to build up their nuclear weapons makes no sense to me because you're creating something you will never use. If you do use them, you don't want to survive it. You don't want to live in that world. So it, talk about zero-sum game. There's no upside to doing this. Uh, and so I don't understand what China is trying to prove, uh, nor do I understand any kind of reaction on our part. Uh, the, the doctrine remains between uh, the nuclear powers. We will have mutual assured destruction. And in that, the delivery mechanism is the crucial thing. Can you uh, assure in a mutually assured destruction that your weapons will be launched in counter to their weapons? That's the whole game here. So that's where we should pay attention to. We don't need more nuclear missiles. We certainly don't need more nuclear warheads. And if any one of those that is manufactured ever gets into the wrong hands, gets into the hands of a terrorist or some kind of uh, radical group, well, then uh, uh, say goodbye to your civilization uh, because they will absolutely set it off. Here's something else to worry about in other news. Our president says Americans can rest assured that our banking system is safe. Well, unfortunately, that statement has got me worried about my bank. And is my bank safe? 
and the failure of two banks has rattled markets and could affect the Fed's policy of raising interest rates to fight inflation. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. President Biden addressed the nation Monday, telling Americans there's no threat of a widespread collapse. Americans can rest assured that our banking system is safe. Your deposits are safe. Let me also assure you, we will not stop at this. We'll do whatever is needed. Still, customers at Silicon Valley Bank lined up to get their money out, and some regional banks saw their stock prices plummet due to retreating investors. The president is calling on Congress for more regulation on small banks. Some in the banking industry are blaming the SVB collapse on the Federal Reserve's policy of raising interest rates to fight inflation. Greg McBride of Bankrate told CBN's Faith Nation concern over the health of the economy could affect the Fed's decision whether to continue raising rates. If they're still swatting hockey pucks away trying to stabilize the financial system, then no, interest rates, uh, further interest rate hikes are, are certainly going to be on hold for some time. According to this morning's government report, inflation was up four-tenths of a percent as expected, with inflation running at 6% over last year. Well, Americans on both coasts are bracing for major storms. California expecting flooding rains up to six inches and winds nearly topping 60 miles an hour. New evacuation warnings issued for rain-soaked Santa Cruz County. In Monterey County, the Pajaro River overwhelming this community after a levee gave way early Saturday morning. Thousands are out of their homes, and it could be weeks before they can return. Damage to farms and crops is estimated at $330 million. On the East Coast, a nor'easter could dump up to 30 inches of snow on parts of New York and New England tonight. The mayor of New York City already declaring an emergency. Well, the week after daylight savings times presents a challenge, or at least an inconvenience for most Americans, but for some, it can be life-threatening. Studies show a 24% increase in heart attacks the Monday after the time change, as well as a surge in hospitalizations due to irregular heartbeat. Doctors suspect it's related to a disruption of sleep. Heart disease is America's number one killer, and the CDC reports someone dies from cardiovascular disease every 34 seconds. Doctors say many of these deaths can be avoided by making healthier choices. But as Lori Johnson explains, most Americans don't even know where to start. Whether it's a heart attack, stroke, or plaque buildup, doctors say poor lifestyle choices largely contribute to heart disease, and adopting healthier habits can turn things around. But do Americans know how to do that? Although heart disease remains America's leading cause of death, the good news is the number of people dying from it has been steadily decreasing over the last 40 years. But that downward trend stopped about five years ago and has remained the same ever since. A Cleveland Clinic survey finds Americans harbor a number of misconceptions when it comes to heart health. For example, 10% believe a fast food diet is the most heart healthy, while 72% incorrectly think low fat or low carb diets are best, while only 15% know the healthiest is actually the Mediterranean diet. It has the best data for actually reducing strokes and heart attacks, and there's large randomized clinical trials that, that show this. Many don't know the Mediterranean diet consists mostly of fruits and vegetables, a.k.a. good carbs. So if you think about your plate as a pie chart, 60 to 70 percent of that should be fruits and vegetables. The Mediterranean diet also includes healthy fats like olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil has an anti-inflammatory component called oleic acid. And we know that some cardiovascular risk is driven by overall or systemic inflammation within the body, so that can be helpful. Beans, poultry, and fish are on the health menu, but not shellfish, red meat, pork, or processed foods. Chips, crackers, pastries, lunch meats, those are the killers. Losing excess weight can be good for the heart, although a whopping 71% of us don't know the best way to do that. A majority of Americans thought that exercise was the biggest thing that, that we could do to, uh, to lose weight, um, where we know that really isn't true. Now, exercise is, is important for overall cardiovascular health, but if you really want to get your weight down and, and become a healthy weight, the biggest thing that 
people need to do is modify their diet. Too many Americans don't realize the importance of keeping their blood pressure and cholesterol in check. Most people should be seeing their primary care doctor and they should be checking that. And more people need to know there are other heart attack symptoms beyond chest pain and pressure. For women, I typically say also that, that nausea or, or any type of gastrointestinal symptoms that just are lingering and not going away, um, you should at least think about maybe it's my heart. So while there's a lot we can do to lower our risk of heart disease, the first step is getting the right information. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thank you, Lori. Well, more than 100,000 Ukrainians who sought refuge in the United States after the Russian invasion will be allowed to remain beyond a one-year deadline. A special program gave quick access to Ukrainians fleeing the war, but it's limited and must be renewed. The Biden administration granting that extension to some 113,000 people in the days before the deadline expired. In Turkey, hundreds of thousands of people are still displaced in the aftermath of the devastating earthquakes. With no permanent shelter and limited food and water, victims need outside help to survive. As Dan Rainey shows us, CBN's Operation Blessing is there to meet the needs. It's been just over a month since a massive earthquake hit Turkey, and the devastation is really unbelievable. Demolition has begun, cleanup has begun in many areas. The most that's been accomplished so far is just clearing the streets enough for cars and trucks to get through. Many people in this area simply left after the earthquake. Uh, they either went to live with other family members, they found a new home somewhere, they rented an apartment, or some even just up and left the country altogether. The people that stayed stayed either because they don't have family elsewhere, they are too poor to be able to travel or their family's too poor to be able to host them, or they simply don't want to leave their home city. Whatever the reason was for people to stay, those are the people that Operation Blessing is here to help. Operation Blessing has been doing numerous food distributions. The stuff in here will keep a family going for quite a while. Sugar, rice, flour, cooking oil, pasta, and more. These food boxes are really, really making a difference in people's lives and they are extremely appreciative for them. Thank you very, very, very much. We are thankful just to be alive and we are very grateful for your help. Thank you very much. So Operation Blessing is here in Hittai, Turkey, giving people what they need right now, food, water and hope. Gordon, Operation Blessing providing a lifeline to people desperately in need. And that's you if you're part of the Operation Blessing disaster relief team. If you haven't given to the fund, I invite you to do it right now. All you have to do is call us 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing disaster relief fund. You can write to us, just put Disaster Relief Fund in a memo line of a check to CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. You can also text to give, OBDR, to 71777, and your gift will go into a designated fund for disaster relief victims. Uh, and whether that's Ukrainian refugees trying to make it in Poland, uh, what's happening in Turkey, the ongoing uh, devastation there, 300 miles of uh, that area of Turkey was destroyed by this earthquake. Millions of people affected. Those who were able to leave have done so, but now the ones that stay, they need the basics of life. They need food, they need shelter, they need heat. They need the things that you and I take for granted, and we want to be there for them in their time of need. If you wanna help, call us right now, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to cbn.com. There's a place on the giving page where you can designate, and again, it's a designated fund, Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. No president, no government, and a police force without any power. There are now armed gangs in charge of the Capitol. Haiti is described by its residents as hell on earth. Now the call is rising for a special international force to intervene in the anarchy. CBN's Chuck Holden brings us the latest from the border of Haiti. 
Haiti's reputation as a failed state is growing. In January, its last 10 elected senators stepped down, leaving the Caribbean country without a functioning government. The result is anarchy as armed and violent gangs rule the streets. Jimmy Cherizier, whose street name is Barbecue, is known as Haiti's most powerful and feared gang leader. In his neighborhood, called La Saline, he's the closest thing to law these people know. Barbecue considers himself a community leader. I'm not a thief. I'm not involved in kidnapping. I'm not a rapist. I'm just carrying out a social fight to claim a better life for all the people in the world. Better known internationally as a criminal, his G9 gang took control of this Haitian fuel depot late last year, while it caused even more misery in a place already described by residents as hell on earth. He says they did it to try and force change. You, in your country, if you were living in these conditions as in La Saline, if you saw the conditions in which our people are living, wouldn't you revolt? With little to no organized government, Haiti's embattled police force is virtually powerless. In January alone, 15 cops died battling the gangs. That sparked violent protests from the police themselves. We need a revolution. We need to have a bloodbath. We're in the streets to fight for our brothers and sisters who are victimized by the bandits. And we have to take to the streets every day to get what we want. The violence has forced many U.S. missions here to severely curtail work in the country. In 2019, Dr. Doug Berbella was on his 35th mission trip here when gang members shot him at a roadblock. At the time, Berbella thought his life was over. Morning. I just want to know I love you and I love you, Michael. Michael, I want you to be a pilot. I'll never give up that dream for the war. Miraculously, he's made a full recovery, although his Haiti ministry is stalled because of the situation on the ground. We're almost out of food, so we generally feed thousands of kids every day. And we can't get a shipping container from the shipping port up to the northwest. It's impossible right now. Gas stations are closed, so even if we had access to a truck and it made it through the roadblocks, we can't even buy fuel. With options dwindling, many Haitians are fleeing across their shared border with the Dominican Republic, including some of Dr. Barbella's friends. And they're in fear for their lives. Uh, they watch people get killed in front of their house in Port-au-Prince, so uh, we help them flee to the DR. Today, nearly 25% of the total population of the DR is made up of Haitians over two million of whom are there illegally. What you see here is the main border crossing between Haiti and the Dominican Republic where I'm standing. A lot of people come across here during the day to shop in this buffer zone between the two countries and they can come and go at will if they like, but if they wanna go any further into the DR, they have to have a special visa. That's getting harder and harder to obtain because there are so many illegal immigrants inside the Dominican Republic has become too costly for them, and they're taking a very tough stand on those illegal crossers to the point that they're actually building a wall like we see on the U.S. southern border. The United Nations recently called for military intervention in Haiti, but the U.S. has already intervened here 19 times in Haiti's history without much to show for it. For his part, Dr. Berbella says there's only one way things will improve. Apart from military intervention from another country, I would say revival, a good old fashioned revival would be the only thing I could see that could turn this country around. From the Haitian border in the Dominican Republic, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Well, I've been in disaster zones where lawlessness had broken out and literally you, you know, can drive through the area. You're trying to dodge burned out vehicles, but you see these makeshift signs, looters will be shot on site. As, as property owners trying to protect what is left. And the complete breakdown, where there's no water, there's no sewage, there's no cell phone, there's no transportation, nothing's open, there's no job, there's no work, there's no income. All of these things combine. And when you have a failed state that Haiti clearly has, uh, there's where do you go and, and what do you do? Uh, let's pray and let's pray that they have that revival and that they come to themselves and realize we need stability. Uh, we need to have the peace on earth, goodwill towards men. We need to have these things. Uh, at the same time, I think they need some kind of organized military to come in there to establish law and order 
Otherwise, you're going to get this rise of warlords where armed gangs uh, want to take over and then uh, that in, of a, in and of itself creates in, inequalities that are just absolutely unimaginable. And it's repeated over and over and over again in history uh, where, you know, the warlord period of China after their uh, attempt at democracy failed. And then it led to communism for China. What's it going to lead to in, in Haiti? I don't know. But when uh, a strong military comes in and says, we're here for law and order, we're not here for corruption, we're not here to take over, we're here to have a transition to a civilian government, well, you might be able to see something. But first and foremost, we need revival there. We need revival right here at home in America. We need revival around the world. We need to humble ourselves and pray and ask God to heal our land. And today, let's ask him to heal Haiti. Terry? Stan and Audrey Crawford were both dentists already raising a family of five. Yet Audrey felt in her heart that there was room for one more. Six trips to Ghana and nine months of paperwork later, they adopted their son, Emmanuel, and rescued him from a life of slavery to human traffickers. Emmanuel Crawford is a record-setting high school running back in Grove, Oklahoma, and a Gatorade Player of the Year. You'd expect his rare explosiveness and vision, but not Emmanuel's early childhood start. That led to a unique, elaborate match of one's longing for family and another's desire to adopt. This family in Grove and his slave kid in Ghana come together. That's, that is God. At age three, Emmanuel was sold by his birth parents, victim to human trafficking and forced labor, enslaved to Ghana's fishing industry. Emmanuel, what's the stamped memory that you have of those early days in Ghana? It was a pretty dark um, memory and stamped memory of what it was like. Just a wooden canoe with holes. And, you know, my job as a three-year-old was to scoop the water out of the boats to keep it afloat, taking water, throwing it over the side because the holes were, you know, so big. Not a place to sit? No. On your knees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember waking up super early mornings um, and being out there all day. A world away in Grove, Stan and Audrey Crawford are both dentists, and in 2010, raising their five growing kids. Audrey had always had it in her heart from the Lord that there was to be another child, even though we were already a pretty big family. One day I was at the dental office and I had a patient, and she knew an another lady. They had been rescuing kids in Ghana, West Africa. And so then that's what opened the door, and then through asking, our friend Pam Cope, who had Touch a Life Ministry, who was part of the rescue of Emmanuel. For us to be chosen was, was amazing because she just said, look at this video and take a trip with me to Ghana. My name is Ima. I'm five years old. Before we did anything, we made sure with all of the siblings that they were going to be okay with it, that it wasn't going to feel like that it took away from their lives or from their attention. We got their blessing and they've loved him ever since. After six trips to Ghana and nine months of paperwork, the adoption was ready. Take us to that day. Your mom and dad come in and you're introduced to them. I kind of just knew something better is coming. It was an immediate connection. It wasn't something that was forced and you could really feel that the Holy Spirit had made that connection possible and it was meant to be. And I just always thought it was funny that, you know, God would put me in a town with a lake. The very thing that threw my life into a spiral at the beginning would be the very thing that I begin to appreciate. Where does it make you go in thinking a creator goes ahead of us? I think Emmanuel believed and came in agreement with God as a little child. And we are told the story by the Ghanaian that rescued him. He would go around saying, I will wrestle with the white men. Say that in his native tongue. Now, where did he get that? Because he had not seen a white man. It just blowed with his brothers because they wrestled plenty on the living room floor. And definitely out on the football field with his teammates. He has wrestled with the white man for sure. In his formative years, he had to protect himself. So he saw everything. He can see the whole field from a hover view. He sees and he knows how to protect himself to get to the end zone. Stan, what is football brought uniquely to Emmanuel? Well, it's, it's brought him the opportunity to trust other men, meaning coaches, to listen to them because he grew up without any father figure, 
with other men treating him harshly. There was a lot of cussing and, you know, yelling, but I felt a sense of peace, which is crazy for somebody that's been through something like that at a young age to feel. But I never felt like I trust other human beings. Where did you find that peace? The times that I feel the most peace is when I'm just talking to God. I just started feeling this unlike necessary anger or frustration. I just heard a voice say, you know, you gotta let it go. I sat there and cried and, you know, said, I forgive you, Mom, I forgive you, Dad. I forgive the people that hurt me when I was younger. I grew so much spiritually, just letting go of the baggage and getting into the Word. Just being able to have that moment at a young age has completely changed my outlook. Emmanuel, what does that name mean to you? Even from a young age, it was very evident to me that there was something bigger than myself. And so when I got here and I learned the meaning behind my name, God with us, that's been my whole entire life. That's the only way that, you know, any of this could have happened because God is with me. How important was community in their support for your family? Oh, community support was huge. You could tell the community was going to be behind him. You know, there was some fear in me because we're almost an all-white community in Grove, Oklahoma. And I think of my dad, who was always a little bit prejudiced. He changed. It changed him. And one of his last times to talk to the family before he passed, he said uh, how proud he was of Emmanuel and that we brought him. To those that want to adopt an at-risk child, what's your encouragement to them? Ask God. Ask those around you. We're going to have to take a step. And then when we said yes to Emmanuel, we didn't know how long the process or how much it would cost us. That step of faith of not knowing. I appeared bold, but I was always afraid. I didn't realize it, but I was fearful. I'm not afraid anymore. When you see God do something that magnificent and just the joy and satisfaction of seeing night turn to day. But if you asked me, I would say yes to anything. I just see his love for us, his love for everyone. His love flows through each of us. And he's a great father. It's a great example for me to be a father. Emmanuel's story journey shifts to Fayetteville, Arkansas, soon to run as a Razorback, continuing a transformation that surges with redemption. Don't be a victim to your circumstances, things that have happened to you, the things that have been, you know, done wrong. You become a prisoner to your own mind. I would have had hardened my heart to promises and redemption that God has brought me through. If not a victim, Emmanuel, then what? A uh, conqueror. Look how big your God is. Wow. Well, that story should speak to all of us, shouldn't it? Because things happen in our lives that want us to be held captive to our own minds, to repeating the thing that's been done to us that's unfair, that's been painful, that's extracted a great price. But Emmanuel tells us the key to having victory from that, you know, it's let it go. It doesn't mean what was done to you was okay. It means you're not going to be identified by it. So do what he did if you're struggling in that area of your life with unforgiveness. Just go to the Lord and say, okay, I here it is. I'm giving it all to you and I'm asking you for freedom, for forgiveness, for a new beginning. I'm asking you for your plan, God, not the plan others had for my life, but for your plan for me. If some of you are struggling with forgiveness in your life, we have a wonderful resource for you. It's free and we'd love to send it to you. It's just called forgiveness, God's power in your life. Forgiveness unlocks the door to being a conqueror. And that's exactly what has happened in this young man's life. How appropriately named he is, Emmanuel. And we thank him for the teaching that we all just had in hearing his story. By the way, if you'd like this, you can call for it. There's our number on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. We'd be happy to send it to you. It's absolutely free. Gordon? What a wonderful story. Yeah. And it just reminds me of so many things that, that God has taught me through the years. If you don't let go of your past, you can't yeah. have a future in Him. And when you have Emmanuel, when you have God with you, in you, well, then you can't help but forgive. And for many of us, like me, forgiving yourself is part of that as well to say i let go of that 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 gordon died a long time ago there's a new one and it's made possible because jesus is living in me 
Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. What started as four days of services has blossomed into a 19-week revival in Hammond, Louisiana. 34 people dedicated their lives to Christ on the first night at Old Zion Baptist Church. By day four, the gymnasium was packed full. Soon after, evangelist David Harrison of Voice of Hope Ministries set up a 2,500-seat tent on the grounds to accommodate the crowds. The ministry reports more than 1,300 people so far have accepted Christ. Countless lives have been changed, and the momentum is only growing. Well, a man once described as the greatest evangelist in the United Kingdom took home an Oscar award Sunday night. Artist Charlie Mackesy, the one-time atheist-turned-believer, won for his short film, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. The animated screenplay is based on Mackesy's popular book telling the story of four creatures forming an unlikely bond. The renowned artist telling CBN News back in 2015 that it was Jesus who introduced him to art, opening his eyes to the beauty in people. One of Mackesy's goals is now to remind unbelievers they are seen and loved. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Well, children around the world are learning the stories of the Bible thanks to CBN Superbook. And in countless countries like the Buddhist nation of Cambodia, adults are also learning those stories. Ten-year-old Parveen spent a lot of time playing on her own because she couldn't seem to get along with others, including her parents. I did not think my parents loved me. They bought gifts for my brother, but not for me. Parveen said after her dad went to work, many days her mom, Sophia, left to play cards with friends. I was afraid of being isolated, so I kept going. Also, whenever I feel stressed and alone, I went to drink and play. One day, a teacher from an after-school program supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise invited Parveen to attend. They taught me to dance and sing. I felt really happy there. Then they taught me about God's love. Then we watched Superbook. At the end of one Superbook episode, the teacher asked the children if they wanted to pray and become Christians. Parveen said yes. Superbook taught me that God loved me. I asked him to forgive my sins. I also asked him to help my mom to stop drinking and playing cards. Parveen prayed for her family every day. She talked to her Buddhist parents about Superbook and the Bible. Then she invited them to church. Pavan invited me to go to the church. I always said no. She keeps on asking me, so I decided to go. I watched many Superbook episodes and I learned that God loves me and forgive my sin. Then I decided to believe in Jesus. Since my wife believed in Jesus, she has changed. She no longer drinks or plays cards. Now our whole family are Christian. Because of Superbook, my parents and brother know Jesus, just like I do. Thank you for giving us Superbook. And that thank you goes to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you help make that happen. You help preach the gospel around the world. A portion of every gift you could give goes into the work of CBN International to do just that. You're a part of everything we do when you join. If that's you, if you'd like to join with us and say, yes, I want to make a difference in the world, just pick up a phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to become a member of the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some can afford more. So if you'd like to give more, we've got 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level God is speaking to you to give, do it right now. Call us, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. Now, when you give monthly on the Internet, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. Bank doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you, Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs or downloads, your choice. Uh, and it's all because you signed up for Pledge Express, and you said, I want to make this payment automatic. You can also do that by phone. When you call 1-800-700-7000, just say, I want to join Pledge Express. Do it now, 1-800-700-7000.
Terry. Autumn Carver was eight months pregnant when she contracted COVID. She became so sick her unborn baby had to be delivered by emergency C-section. Soon Autumn was put on life support and her husband was told she had no chance for survival. They walked in and said, it's a boy and he was doing fine. The emergency C-section had gone well for Zach Carver's third child. He was now resting in the neonatal intensive care unit. His wife, Autumn, however, was in ICU, fighting for her life. I was told that she had 0% chance of survival. I mean, the worst day of my life. Autumn was eight months pregnant when she and Zach contracted COVID-19 in mid-August 2021. Zach recovered quickly. Autumn did not. By late August, she was in ICU on a ventilator with acute respiratory distress syndrome and having an emergency C-section to save the life of the baby. Now she was on advanced life support, called ECMO. I've been with Autumn since I was 14 years old. I don't know life without her, and so they're telling me that she's not gonna survive. It was, it was traumatic. In the coming weeks, Autumn remained in critical condition. All Zach could do was pray and ask God for a miracle. I would sit with her and pray and pray over her, and it was just overwhelming. And so I'd go walk the halls or go sit in the waiting room, and I was begging him to keep her alive. Let her beat the odds. I need her. You know, the kids need her. By now, Zach had posted a prayer request on Facebook that ignited a wildfire on social media. Literally millions of people all over the world were just praying for us. I told him I'm not leaving here without Autumn. I prayed all the time, every second. I can't even explain it, I guess, but I just knew that she was going to survive. During the day, Zach maintained a vigil at Autumn's side. At night, he visited his two daughters and baby son Huxley, who were staying with their grandparents. Then he returned to an empty, dark house. It was super sad. I would come in, uh, get some food, go to bed. I hated being here. With the arrival of fall came more complications for the young mother and wife. Multiple infections, anemia, and a cardiac arrest. Doctors had few answers and even considered a double lung transplant, but dismissed the idea. Instead, they suggested that Autumn be taken off life support and allowed to die peacefully with a do not resuscitate order in place. Zach declined, refusing to give up. The main doctor said there was a 0% chance that she would survive. I remember going off on my own that afternoon and like, I. I don't know, somewhere in the hospital. I've been praying. I just knew that she wasn't going to die. Zach and millions on Facebook continued to pray as Zach began searching for a second opinion. In early October, there was one hopeful moment. Autumn's vital signs improved slightly, and doctors agreed to Zach's request that she be taken out of sedation and off ECMO long enough for her to see and hold Huxley for the first and perhaps last time. I obviously had very little strength to hold myself up, so they got me all propped up with lots of pillows all around me, and they brought him in, and they put him in my arms. Zach was helping me. We got to feed him a bottle. So they took him, and then they just, like, laid him to my side, and he just kind of, like, curled up and went to sleep. <laughs> the reunion was short-lived as Autumn was put back on ECMO. Then another answer to prayer. Renowned thoracic surgeon, Dr. Ankit Barat at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago agreed to evaluate Autumn for a double lung transplant. We got transferred up to Chicago and that doctor day two said, whether you need a lung transplant or not, you're gonna be fine. Although still on life support, Autumn was only lightly sedated. Now she and Zach could pray together as they waited for Dr. Barat's decision. Before long, he gave them the best news they could have ever hoped for. He came in and said, you don't need a lung transplant, you're gonna be fine. It was super good news, super, super good news. You know, we embraced in a hug and, and thank God and the doctor. Autumn was weaned slowly from the VA ECMO machine and continued to improve. On November 11th, Three months after being given no hope for survival, Autumn was discharged from Northwest Memorial Hospital to begin three weeks of rehabilitation. On December 1st, 2021, 
Autumn walked out of the hospital smiling and unassisted. We pulled in the driveway and our neighbors were in our yard like yelling and screaming and <laughs> trying not to cry. Uh -huh. It was just emotional. It was a whole host of emotion. Just uh, the opportunity to see my kids grow, spend time with my husband. Every day is a gift. My daughter said, I believe in miracles, mommy. The neighborhood is quiet today. Autumn is busy providing her family with all the TLC they missed and more. But life in the Carver family will never be the same. Tell people you love them, give lots of hugs. It can just all change so quickly and you don't want to leave anything unsaid. I'm closer with my family. I say prayers with my kids every single night now. I didn't do that before. I'm super grateful and I, uh, I don't go throughout the day, you know, without saying multiple prayers and prayer saved my wife. And not only did it save her life, but it changed my life. Prayer is so important. I mean, it's everything. It, it saved my life. When people are flooding the gates of heaven, there was no way it could be ignored. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer changes things. We know that. We know you know that. And that's why we love to be able to pray with you on this program on a regular basis. You know, this is a family whose life was put back together by the power of prayer. People who were crying out to heaven on their behalf. And what a wonderful story of a family completely restored because of the goodness of God. So we want to pray for you today. Many of you probably have issues as big, maybe even bigger bigger than this family faced. I don't know, but God knows. And you know, that's the one thing I think that we need to hang on to is something may be a surprise to us, but it is not a surprise to God. And so he's in your now and he's already in your tomorrow. And it allows us to live the now in a completely different way than we would have if we didn't know. We have a heavenly father who's in charge of it all. So let's pray. Okay. Well, we got some prayers. We we'll, sure do. We got some praise reports. Here's Rose from China Springs, Texas. She had a jaw malady for 55 years. She's 72. She's had it for 55 years. Terry prayed on the show. Someone, you have something wrong with your mouth, with your jaw in alignment. You have had problems for a long time. Wow. Right now, in Jesus' name, you've been healed. Well, Rose from China Springs, Texas, believed that, and Rose was completely healed. Praise and God. that is a miracle. <laughs> that is a miracle. Well, this is Claudette. She wrote by email saying, I was diagnosed last October with congestive heart failure, which just appeared out of the blue. One day in February, I was listening to the 700 Club, lying on the couch, totally exhausted. Gordon was praying and said, there's someone with a heart problem. I think he even said congestive heart failure. I raised my hand and claimed the healing. At the next doctor visit, my echocardiogram showed that my heart had improved from a 15% ejection fracture to 35%. This had also slowed down the failure of my kidneys due to poor blood flow. Doctors were astounded that there had been such an improvement. I have seen several doctors since then, and things keep continuing to improve. I truly believe God healed my body from this hor horrific heart problem. Okay, we're going to pray. <laughs> Before we pray, we've we didn't welcome Terry back, but no. welcome Terry back. And we're going to pray for Andy right now. Andy is Terry's Thank husband. You. Andy had a stroke last week. And yeah. right now it needs to be touched by God Almighty and needs to be healed. So join with us. Let's create a great mm -hmm. circle of prayer. We're going to lift you up. We're going to lift up Andy. We're going to lift up everyone watching. And we're going to let God do what he has promised to do, Thank that he will heal all our diseases. He will forgive all our iniquities. He will crown us with loving kindness, with his tender mercies. He will renew our strength. I'm claiming that one. He will do all these things. Why? Because he loves you. So let's just fall back into that love and let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come into agreement. And first we ask for Andy that you would restore his brain that all the circuits would fire normally and that his left leg and his left arm would no longer be paralyzed, mm. but have complete feeling movement strength. 
Lord Jesus. Renew his mind, Lord God. Heal him right now. For those watching right now, I just ask that you would baptize them in your love. Faith always works through love. Pour out your love on them that they may know, they may see and hear the greatness of your power. Do it now, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's someone you've got incredible acid reflux. Uh, there's scarring on your esophagus, your deep pain. God is healing you right now. He's restoring all the tissue in your esophagus. He's restoring that juncture with your uh, stomach. He's making sure everything's going to be properly sealed off from this day forward. You've been afraid of eating certain foods. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be afraid anymore. Yes. God has touched you and has healed you in Jesus' name. Yes, someone else, <clears throat> you're an older woman, and just like the person who had the 55 years uh, of a condition that changed her life and was ruining her life, you've had a condition with your feet, like your ankles. They're very swollen. You'll know this as you because you have a pair of shoes that you wear consistently, and it has a strap over it. They almost look like little girl Marianne. Mary Jane shoes. God's healing that condition for you. All the blood flow through your vascular system is changing. There's going to be a tingling in your feet as he heals you completely in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you have a condition with your left eye, and this is how you'll know it's you. You wear uh, special glasses on the right eye. It's clear, and, and you you're use that eye to see with. Left eye is, uh, the glasses are, are, are darkened uh, so that no light comes in. God is healing your eyes now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. If you've been touched, let us know. Let us share your good report. And if you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that doesn't give up until you get an answer. All you have to do is call us. On tomorrow's show, Terry's going to be back with Andy, so we're going to have Ashley, and then Terry's back on Thursday and Friday. Here's a word for you. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord.